this will be the last uh, video in this sequence. I want to go back to uh, our dialogue, which has taken up a lot of uh, these videos. Who is who is right about um, the perception of about the description of uh, space and time? Uh, is it the the, sp the Earthlings or the Newtonian point of view, or is it the spaceman's point of view, Einstein and general relativity? Um, and the first thing is, I'm, I might have given you the impression from the, the, this dialogue perspective and kind of these different ways of looking at things, that it might be just a philosophical debate. Um, is it just that we've got a counterintuitive way of describing exactly the same uh, theory of gravity? I mean, even if that were true, it would be a very interesting way of describing it. But the key facts are that Newtonian gravity is simply incompatible with special relativity. And we know special relativity is true. And so that's, that was one of Einstein's huge hints that he had to come up with a new theory of gravity because he had come up with special relativity. He was sure that it was the right description of reality um, and that it had to be, that gravity had to be incorporated in that, in that some way. Um, and Newton, Newton's description was just not going to work. And more important, the detailed theories are not equivalent. And I haven't said a lot about that. I've been talking about how um, you can think of them at some level as two different perspectives on the same phenomena, at least terrestrial gravitational phenomena. But when you get beyond that, you, descri you discover there really are differences. Three famous examples, um, two historical and one recent. One is the bending of light by the sun or by galaxies. Um, this, the bending of light by sun was observed famously in uh, an eclipse and observations of, of stars during and after an eclipse. And that was one of the first big tests of general relativity. Uh, New Newton's gravity, a version of Newtonian gravity combined with a theory of light would actually dis predict some bending, but not the same amount. Um, more recently, you can get what's called gravitational lensing. There is a galaxy in the middle of this picture. And this, these four dots are actually four images of exact same quasar behind that galaxy because the light is bent by uh, the galaxy intervening. And that's a dramatic confirmation of these general relativity ideas. Another historical example is the, the advance of the perihelion of the planet Mercury. Mercury goes around in an elliptical orbit, and the closest point to the sun uh, doesn't stay in the same location. It precesses. It go, moves slowly around the sun. And some of that is due to the perturbations of other planets. But if, even if you carefully analyze all that, you get the wrong answer from Newtonian gravity. And general relativity gives you the right answer. It was another big confirmation. Nowadays, it's actually rather easy for us to see very tiny terrestrial effects of general relativity. For example, the GPS satellites, this is a diagram of the, all the GPS satellites zooming around the Earth, the way they tell you your position so accurately is they know their positions very accurately and they know the time very accurately. And they send these signals, and, depend, and depending on how, when your receiver gets these time signals from the different uh, satellites, the difference in times can be used to triangulate your position. Well, if you want to get as good accuracy as possible, you actually have to include some small but significant general relativistic corrections, to, uh, especially to the clock timing, um, that time gets bent, just like space gets bent, because space and time are linked together, basically, by special relativity. Um, time gets bent a little bit in the presence of gravity. And you have to take into account that into account. Now, of course, most famously, there are extreme situations where you do get large effects. These are all pretty small effects. And the, the GPS thing is tiny. It's only because we have such incredible precision nowadays you can measure it. But in more extreme situations, you get a very large effect. Big, probably the most obvious one is black holes. Here's an uh, artist's impression of a black hole with matter streaming into it in an accretion disk and a jet of energy coming out uh, from the extremely hot matter just before it hits the black hole. Um, and so that's a huge prediction. The Big Bang, of course, is probably the biggest prediction of all. The idea of uh, a dynamic and expanding universe. Um, the black holes and Big Bang come into the story in a, in a wonderful way from a mathematical point of view. They're both examples of what are called singularities, points where the smooth structure of space and time break down. Uh, and you get something you can think of as a, a kind of a, a whole taken out of uh, a smooth fabric or a, like a pinch point or a, a, a cusp, something very sharp. That's, those, are, those are also examples of singularities. There are some wonderful mathematical theorems from the late 60s that show that if you assume the basic structure of general relativity, these singularities are unavoidable. This was, these were very important results because when peop, people first started saying, I think there are black holes out there, or I think there might be a Big Bang, 
it was not obvious. Uh, the models that they had to, to show that were, were very symmetric and very special. And there was a strong suspicion that maybe a more generic kind of random model with a lot of fluctuations and noise and things like that would, ava would avoid what the models, the simple models seem to be telling us, which were that black holes and, and, and uh, the Big Bang singularity at the start of the universe seem to be inevitable. And these theorems due to Hawking, uh, the famous Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, um, showed that under very general assumptions, you're going to get singularities out of this, this theory, out of general relativity. Um, and so that convinced more people uh, that these were really real features. And nowadays, we really do see these things that it's hard to explain in any other way, it's the black holes and the Big Bang, lots of evidence for these things. Um, so as I said, the main thing, uh, this very dramatic prediction, is that the universe exp itself, the geometry of the universe, is dynamic, and in particular, it's expanding. And just a tiny bit of the history, that that was a very disturbing thing at first. Uh, that's not how people thought of the universe. And Einstein himself didn't like that prediction coming out of his theory, and he put a fudge factor into his theory to make a static universe. Very shortly thereafter, Hubble dis discovered the expansion of the universe in terms of um, looking at galaxies and how fast they're moving away from us, which can be measured by the redshift of their radiation coming at us. And he, put, he took that, uh, that fudge factor back out, and then he called it his greatest blunder. And we'll see in a minute, um, as I go through this very quick summary of interesting predictions, uh, that maybe it wasn't his greatest bl blunder. Another stunning prediction is that of gravitational waves. So um, remember, I was saying that curvature necessarily propagates from one region to another. If you've, if you've got some curvature in some region, if you're bunching up the fabric in some place, it's going to stretch the fabric nearby. And in particular, if you've got a dynamic system, if you've got something moving, like this is a schematic picture of uh, two black holes orbiting each other very, very closely, then you're going to have time vari variations in the curvature of space and space-time in that region. Those, are those ripples are going to propagate out. Um, and it's not horribly inaccurate to picture that as sort of ripples on a fabric or even on, a, on the surface of a lake or something like that. It, it has the same kinds of features. They are wave behavior. Um, they're more complicated, they're in four dimensions, they have somewhat different properties, but they are fundamentally wave behavior. Um, and the production of these things is by basically cataclysmic events or very rare events like two black holes orbiting each other, which in fact, uh, the way black holes work is they won't stably orbit each other this close to each other. They'll eventually inspiral and annihilate each other and kind of coalesce. Two neutron stars will do this as well. They'll orbit each other for a while and then coalesce in a big, big, huge explosion, basically. Those kinds of events, the, the, the orbiting really tightly produces gravitational waves, and especially the final in-spiral and coalescing should produce a huge amount of energy radiated in gravitational waves. Trouble is, these are rare events. They're going to be typically far, far away. And gravity is such a weak force. I've been talking a lot in these, in these uh, videos about how fundamentally gravity is really a weak phenomenon. And it takes, for example, the entire mass of the Earth combined together, adding together to produce um, the, the effects that we see on, on the Earth. Since gravity is weak, the detection of gravitational waves is very, very hard. And we have not accomplished it yet. Uh, we are actively trying. There uh, are a few observatories, uh, LIGO, Virgo, GEO, that are online right now, although LIGO, I guess, is, is uh, right now in a down phase trying to transition into what's called advanced LIGO. And the way they do that, LIGO, for example, it, this is an aerial picture. Here's a, um, a building, and then there's a beam line goes out to here, and a mirror, and another beam line, and a mirror out here. And they shoot lasers on these two arms of the L. And the way they do, the way they do that, they shoot the lasers, they combine the, uh, the lasers in a way that measures to see if this length and this length are, uh, uh, are changing relative to each other. The reason for that is the way gravitational waves actually work when they pass through something is that they will stretch in one direction and squish in another. You might, this might look familiar. This is the tidal force diagram. And then, very shortly thereafter, they will stretch in this direction and squish in this direction. And they'll oscillate back and forth between those two modes. So it's not like things are going up and down or in and out. It's this particular kind of squish stretch and then opposite squish stretch that you'll see. So you couldn't detect it from just one beam and one length, but you can detect it from 
uh, comparing two lengths. And you should see that this one gets shorter while this one gets longer, and then vice versa. And you should see a subtle oscillation. The trick is that the amount of the oscillation, even though this is kilometers long, is less, much, much less than the width of an atom. And so you have to be incredibly precise. And so they haven't been able to have a direct det detection yet with, with these various devices. LISA would be a great thing. This would be a space-borne uh, version of LIGO with satellites shooting lasers at each other over um, hundreds, maybe thousands, I guess thousands of kilometers to get a bigger baseline and maybe uh, better detection. It's not going to happen real soon. The, the, the holy grail would be not only to detect these waves, to make sure they really exist, to, find, to kind of uh, nail down that prediction of general relativity, but do actual astronomy with gravitational waves and uh, use them as a telescope. That's maybe far in the future. We'll see. Advanced LIGO might uh, be able to do that in the next few years, maybe. So um, back to this di idea of the whole universe. Um, just to do a few more slides on this, I'm not, it's not going to be mainly a talk about um, the details of the stunning predictions of general relativity. I have another talk that I might put up on YouTube on that, that subject. Um, but just real quick, the idea of the universe as a complicated geometric object and a dynamical geometric object was so new and stunning. It's a wonderful idea. And it leads to questions like, what is the eventual fate of the universe? Will it keep expanding? Will it go, go out and, and crunch back down? The going out and crunch back down picture actually is pretty easily visualizable here. You can th think of the latitude lines as the space direction. And so each line is sort of a one-dimensional simplistic model of a universe that's just a circle, the space direction of a universe. And then time, you can think of going from the bottom up to the top. And what that is a model for is a one-dimensional circular universe which starts out in a big bang, a singularity. It's not a, actually a circle at the start, it's just a point. And boom, it explodes and expands and expands and expands, and then down, 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 and crunches down to a point, another singularity again, where everything gets infinitely dense and the laws of physics seem to not hold. That's really a, a pretty decent uh, schematic picture of what that kind of universe would be, from a big bang to a big crunch. Nowadays, we believe probably that um, this isn't the picture we expect, that we expect continued expansion. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about exactly how much and why. Um, the topology of the universe. I mentioned that the fact that like a sphere closes up on itself and doesn't go off to infinity is an interesting thing about this space, this geometrical space. Um, and there's, it's not clear if maybe our universe is a tiny bit like a torus where you could go around and come back and to, the, to yourself. Or one way to see it, one way to think about it is if a light ray goes around this thing, you end up seeing the back of your own head. Maybe a distant star in, or a distant galaxy in uh, our telescopes is actually our own. This is actually a possibility. Um, you could have a more complicated object. This has uh, three different handles, kind of like a pretzel. Um, there are active experiments to try to determine if we could see the patterns in the sky that would be characteristic of these interesting topologies. Um, some recent mysteries that have come up in the last 30 or 40 years, um, th th probably the most th three most famous and most perplexing, the discovery of dark matter. We know from studying, uh, mainly studying the rotation profiles of galaxies, that uh, there seems to be extra matter in there that we can't detect in any other way. It has a gravitational influence, but no other obvious influence. Should we modify astronomy, meaning maybe this, this is just ordinary matter that we just can't see very well? That used to be a pretty good hypothesis. Nowadays, it's not so popular. Should we modify particle physics? Maybe there's some sort of weird new particle that we can't detect very well that is dark matter. That's a popular theory. Or is this is a sign that general relativity doesn't really work exactly as well as we think it does, even though it's um, gives good predictions in lots of ways. Should we even modify special relativity or even some of the basic things about physics? There's lots of proposals like that. Probably most people would bet that there's some mysterious particle out there. Dark energy. In the last, um, in the last 20 years, we've discovered that the expansion of the universe is not only going on, it's, it's accelerating. And that was a, t a total shock. And this, was a pic this is a picture of the Hubble Deep Field showing going really, really far uh, into the galaxies, very, very far away. Um, and if you look at those galaxies, you look at supernovae, you look, look at a lot of distant phenomena, and you can conclude that the acceleration of the universe, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. That is not what 
uh, general relativity would predict because gravity is on the whole attractive. You have this expansion and then it at least slows down. Maybe it doesn't come back and crunch, but it should at least slow down due to gravity. It's as if there's some sort of uh, repulsive part of gravity that we didn't understand. Well, turns out that it seems to behave a lot like the fudge factor uh, that Einstein called his greatest blunder, called the cosmological constant. Um, that would be somewhat plausible, but kind of weird, because if you allow the cosmological constant into your theory, uh, it's hard to explain how it wouldn't be incredibly huge and rip the universe apart right away. Um, there might well be some connection to fundamental particle physics. Maybe there's some aspect of the standard model that needs to be changed to predict the dark energy. Um, some connection to quantum mechanics. And then inflation uh, is to address the uh, issue of the universe is much more smooth and regular and homogeneous than it seems like it ought to be. Um, and inflation is a theory that says that the universe expanded incredibly quickly right at the start um, for reasons that are still somewhat mysterious. And that's a popular theory because it seems to address why the universe is, is more homogeneous than it ought to be. But it then gives the mystery of what caused the inflation and how can you actually address that. So the current science, uh, there's a lot of experiments and, and uh, observations and theories running around these, these topics. Just one thing to focus on, uh, the Wilkinson Microwave an Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, and that, that was a few years ago. And then currently the Planck satellite, or very recently they were just taking their data, these are satellites that map essentially the very early universe. They look for the continuing resonance of whatever tiny irregularities were, pr were present in the very, very early stages of the universe when it was much smaller. Um, and they, it, what they're really looking for is um, irregularities in the microwave background radiation, which is the, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. And this is a picture from WMAP of what those irregularities look like. If you look at the structure of that, you get a picture, a diagram like this. I'm not going to talk too much about what that means. Um, but you can see that they've got a pretty good fit of the model, the prediction from a certain model with the red and their data. This is the birth of quantity. This picture is the birth of really, truly quantitative cosmology, where you can actually have something where uh, it, there's a real precise and falsifiable theory. There is a not a great fit here, maybe not such a great fit here, but this is much, much more precise than we could have had um, just 20 years ago. Uh, this is the Planck satellite, which is going to hopefully reproduce this picture and this idea even more precisely and, and start to really pick out which theory is, is correct. Now, I can't fail to mention, as on my last slide, the biggest enduring riddle about um, general relativity and that's the incompatibility of general, general relativity with quantum mechanics. It's certainly a philosophical problem. We want a grand, a unified theory, a theory of everything, as they say, that just describes all phenomena at all scales. Um, but, uh, and it's really annoying to have things like general relativity, which seem to describe the universe on large scales very well, and quantum mechanics, which seems to describe it at a small scale, but they don't, they're really fundamentally incompatible. And it's a practical problem with the extreme phenomena. Black holes in the very early universe are times when uh, there's no separation, when the entire universe is very small, or the black holes where gravitational fields are incredibly strong and quantum mechanics can't be avoided. Um, and nobody really knows how to solve this. String theory is a, a huge suggestion to solve this, but it's very problematic. Uh, loop quantum gravity is another suggestion. Uh, somehow. Most people think that space-time at an incredibly small length scale must be not smooth and kind of foamy in some way. Maybe it's made out of uh, these kinds of pieces um, called simplices, all kinds of proposals. It's really still wide open. It's very controversial. Um, sometimes you see it as a, uh, a, a debate between the string theory and loop quantum gravity. It's much more complicated than that. Neither of those are particularly uh, full-fledged, plausible um, theories, uh, and, and the truth might be completely different. We'll see. And that's the end of the talk.